So the first question is, I want to talk about the title of this. Um, the title of this is called, You Can Be a Hero, How Your Food Choices Impact Climate Change, Natural Resource Depletion, Antibiotic-Resistant Bacteria, Treatment of Animals, Extinction of Nature, Water Shortages in the Environment. Did I... Did we get carried away and exaggerate just for marketing purposes? I mean, it seems a little, like, outrageous that I'm saying here that your food, what you're going to eat for lunch or dinner, would have a real effect. So was this just marketing to get people to come to your panel, or are we being serious that your food choices are really making a difference in some of these incredibly important health and environmental issues? Well, I suppose you know your marketing intentions better than I do, but uh, if you were just trying to market, you got lucky <laughs> because that's all true. What we eat has an enormous impact. It sends out ripples that impact our own health, that impact our economy, that impact our environment, that impact animals, that impact people and ecosystems all over the world. What you eat is super personal. It literally becomes you. Um, but it's also very political. It impacts farm workers. It impacts animals and families and whether or not people have the means to feed their own families. Whether it's the chocolate industry, which, you know, um, over half the world's chocolate comes from the Ivory Coast and Ghana, West Africa, where children are enslaved, where the average farmer growing chocolate is paid a dollar a day. And um, when we participate by buying chocolate from Nestle and Mars and Hershey's and the other big chocolate companies from West Africa, we're actually supporting an industry that is profiting at the expense of some of the poorest people on the planet. Or whether it's the factory farming industry, which has r epidemic rates of PTSD. People who are in these industries don't take these jobs because they like bashing in the brains of animals all day long. They take them because they're trying to survive. But essentially, we have the blood on our hands, too, when we, as a consumer, purchase these products, uh, whether it's farm workers who are dying in the fields of pesticide exposure. So I like to illumine the reality that our food choices have these huge impacts because I believe that deep down, almost everybody cares and wants to be a part of something positive on this planet. Nobody likes to feel like their hands are on the chainsaw that's cutting down the rainforest. And when we realize what's really at stake, we realize how powerful we are, that every bite we take is a vote for a healthier world. So yes, I think it is that big and bigger than you're saying in the title. Just quickly before we move on, just due to the urgency of it, what is the actual steps that we should take to avoid antibiotic-resistant bacteria problems. So I'm going to talk about other things, but just to get that out of the way, what, what are the actual solutions that we should be doing? Well, the, the first thing is to know your risk. How dangerous are superbugs to you? If you have a normally functioning immune system, they're not that big of a deal. I have a normally functioning immune system, and I walk into the emergency room every single day treating patients with superbug infections and I'm okay. What I see are people who have medical conditions that alter their immune system or take medications that weaken their immune system and they put them at risk and they don't know it. They don't know that they have a medical condition that leaves them vulnerable. There are undoubtedly superbugs in this room, but you're not gonna be harmed by them. There are 5% of doctors have superbugs on their white coats. Terrifying statistic until you realize that you've got so many different ways to protect yourself from your skin, your immune system, uh, a variety of mechanisms within your body. Now, when my father-in-law got cancer and went on chemotherapy, he became high risk. And we took all sorts of precautions. So the idea that you read an article in the newspaper that says that somebody swabbed the meat in the frozen, you know, the frozen meat section and that it was teeming with superbugs, well... You're going to bring that home and put it on the grill. No superbugs are going to die, and you're going to be okay. So it's a very sophisticated issue that can be simplified down to having a conversation with your doctor and saying, how's my immune system? And if your doctor can't answer that, I tell people, maybe you should get a new doctor. And um, 
I think, oh. I think it's also uh, important to, um, to realize, I remember uh, doing research on uh, the antibiotic resistance and basically about 15 years ago, the statistic was that 50% of all antibiotics that are manufactured are given to humans and 50% are given to livestock. And then it went up to 60% and then to, to livestock and then 70% and then 80%. The last I've read was between 85 and 90% of all antibiotics that are manufactured are not for humans. They are for imprisoned cows, pigs, chickens, turkeys, ducks, geese, goats, and, and other animals that are imprisoned for food. So this is really uh, obviously where most of the antibiotics are being used and where most of the antibiotic resistance is happening. And so it, it's very clear, I think, at a fundamental level that animal agriculture is demonic in the sense that it's, uh, it's, uh, perver it's a perversion at the, and a, a terrible transgression at the foundation of human society that we're imprisoning all these animals completely unnecessarily for food. There are no nutrients that we need to be healthy that we have to imprison and kill animals to get. Right? I've been a vegan for 40 years. I have not been to a doctor in 40 years. I've stayed out of the medical establishment completely. <laughs> and, and I'm not the only one. I mean, in, in general, if we have a strong immune system for eating healthy food and exercising properly and having a positive mental attitude, I mean, health is very complex. There's many factors involved. It's not just food, obviously. There's many factors. But uh, if we're really uh, living our lives, I think, as, as best we can with awareness and consciousness and kindness and so forth, then we have a foundation for health. And animal agriculture destroys the health of billions of animals, right? And that's what it's all about. It's confining these animals. They're living in toxic environments. They have high rates of disease, of cancer. Uh, that's why all these antibiotics are used and all kinds of medications. Over 10,000 different drugs and hormones and chemicals that have been approved to be used on these animals. So they're very sick. And then we're eating these sick animals and we get sick. And so our immune systems are, very, are compromised, obviously, by this. But we're also sowing, and you think about it, from the point of view of as we sow, we reap. If we're doing something that is so perverse and violent and unnatural to imprison animals, and this earth is beautiful and abundant, there's no reason for us to be imprisoning billions of animals in hell holes uh, for any reason. It's something that's been going on. It's been happening. We're born into it. But it's really past time for us to awaken and uh, respond to this in a way to bring it to an end because this, antibi this, this superbug problem is just one of, of hundreds of devastating impacts that are harming us on every level. I mean, everywhere we turn, we see human justice problems that are caused essentially by animal agriculture, starvation and hunger, which is unnecessary because we're growing plenty of food to feed everyone. Uh, there's, there's countless ramifications of this, and this is just one, but to uh, really clearly understand this and then share these ideas with other people in a way that they can understand and hopefully awaken out of this uh, cultural trance that's really injected into all of us from the time we're born here, where we've been forced to eat animal foods, and to realize that this, this has to be the last generation that engages in this perverse behavior and to now awaken out of it. I think that's, that's the essential solution to this problem. I would just add, um, well, first a comment and then a question. So the comment is that last year, 30,000 Americans died from antibiotic-resistant infect bacterial infections, 800,000 people worldwide. And that problem is forecast to accelerate as more bugs become antibiotic-resistant. But Matt, I did want to ask you, um, thanks to your work, um, Will just quoted the statistic of the percentage of antibiotics that are used in livestock going up and up and up, and last I had heard it was 80% as well. But um, has that actually gone down? What, do you know what the current number is? Uh, so we've made progress with certain animals and taken dramatic steps back with others. So cows, we're having some problems. Chickens, we're doing a little bit better. Uh, again, a lot of this has to do with the lobbying groups. Um, the, the thing I will say is that you know, we come from very different perspectives. You know, I'm essentially the medical establishment. I went to Harvard Medical School, I teach at a medical school, and I agree with every single thing you said. Um, it's not uh, talked about. Uh, 
Uh, I, I believe that nutrition and diet gets maybe half of a day in medical school lectures for the entire curriculum. But absolutely, the ways to protect yourself are things that have to do with the holistic view of your body. You know, getting a good night's sleep, cutting out alcohol, eating a plant-based diet, these things can really go a long way, um, a lot farther than some of the supplements that people ask me about. Um, and not to say that they're, they don't work, but to say that, you know, I, I really just, I was struck by what you were saying uh, in terms of how to view this problem. And even though we come at it from different places, uh, there is a whole lot of overlap. Um, just to clarify, did you say that 80% of all antibiotics that are used are used in animals? Is that, is that what you said? In, in the United States, 66% worldwide was the last statistic I had heard, yeah, but the, I don't know the, I don't, it's changed. I actually don't have the most recent data on this. One of the challenges we have is we don't have a good handle. We have a good handle on how many antibiotics doctors are prescribing. We don't have a great handle on dentists. We're trying to do a better job of understanding that. And we also don't know how many people are getting antibiotics illicitly on the black market. You know, it's not that hard to go to get antibiotics in Mexico. Um, and so we don't really know the full scope of the problem, but the numbers that you're citing, uh, are very concerning and they, they sound accurate. So worldwide, are we giving more antibiotics to uh, animals than to humans? Yes. Separating the question of whether you should eat animals or not, if you did choose to eat animals, is it necessary to give them antibiotics to grow it? If someone wanted to raise chickens and cows and pigs, can it be done without giving them antibiotics? Yes, certainly can. Uh, it's more uh, a, you look at these places that do large scale uh, meat producing animals, they have this huge organization, this huge process where they are essentially jailed, as you mentioned, and they pump them full of antibiotics to make them as big as possible but it is not an essential aspect of their lives that they need these antibiotics. Okay, let's go to the, the, the shocking article that came out 15 or so years ago about the relation between animals and climate change. Let me read a paragraph. Climate change emissions from meat production are far higher than currently estimated, according to a con controversial new study, although this is from like 15 years ago, that will fuel the debate on whether people should eat fewer animal products to help the environment. In a paper published by a respected U.S. think tank, the World Watch Institute, two World Bank environmental advisors claim that instead of 18% of global emissions being caused by meat, the true figure is 51%. Do you, so you want to comment on that? Because according to this, uh, is, is, I don't know what the follow-up was since then, but they're saying that where everyone believes that cars and um, trucks are causing all the, the climate change, this is claiming that 51% of climate change or greenhouse gas emissions are ca caused by the whole system of eating animal products. Well, it's a lot. <laughs> um, I think 18% is a lot. It's actually more than the transportation sector. And that's the figure I'm more comfortable citing. I think that the report from World Watch was compelling and interesting, but the researchers I know, and I'm not qualified to dig into this level of research personally, so it's kind of who do I trust that is, that spends years and decades on it. That's their life's work. But the people that I know that have dug in feel that 51% uh, is probably overstated, if you want to be literal about it. But I think that 18% is quite credible, and it could be higher. One of the big questions is, how do you factor in what the land would have been doing if it wasn't being used for livestock? And if it was in forest, or if it was in certain types of ecosystem that are going to be carbon sinks, that are going to pull carbon out of the atmosphere, then that's a fa something we have to consider. And if you consider that perhaps in the mix, we might say, what is the impact of chopping down and burning tropical rainforest and turning that into cattle pasture, then obviously the carbon impact of that is absolutely massive. But if you're taking land that was already grassland and cattle are grazing, or you're growing grain or soy to feed to cattle in feedlots and so forth, um, I think generally, you can look at numbers different ways, 
51 percent feels pretty high. Humans are doing a lot to impact climate change, but there's no question agriculture is massive, and it's the single thing we can have the greatest impact on the most rapidly. I mean, it's, uh, a person would be better off driving a Hummer as a vegan from a climate perspective than, uh, you know, driving a Prius or a, a, one of the, a Tesla um, and eating meat, just from an environmental perspective. And in fact, one study said that you'd be better off driving than walking if you're fueling your walking calories with a steak. So, um, so there's no question, from a pure climate impact perspective, so there's no question it's big any way you slice it. But I think when we look at what that 100% is, there are so many things that go into it, so many different human activities that are impacting the climate that I think it's more than just, we can't just put it all on agriculture. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I would agree uh, with that. I, although I think um, the credentials actually of these uh, two scientists uh, were better than the United Nations scientists who came up with the 18%. They, had, they were more senior scientists who came up with the 51%. And uh, I, read their, I read the rebuttals and the rebuttals to the rebuttals. You had to pay a lot of money to see those articles online, and I decided to pay it because I wanted to find out. And um, I personally, uh, and I'm not an expert either, but you know, I have a, in my PhD work, I did quite a bit of uh, quantitative and qualitative research analysis courses and things. And my feeling is that the 51% is really uh, absolutely true, actually, if you're going to look at, because they, they justified the 51%, I thought, very well with land use, uh, as you were saying, Ocean. And Jeff Anhang, he was one of the two uh, researchers. Uh, has been recently in touch with um, Nelson Campbell uh, and saying that actually the 51% is really too low. He, he could do, he said if he could get funding, which he, it's very difficult to get, he could do more research that would show that the 51% is really uh, too low. It's actually much higher than that. So I think you, you, can't under, you can't really overstate the devastating impact of animal agriculture in terms of I don't want to just limit it to climate because climate is one aspect, which is you know important. But I mean, destruction of rainforest, destruction of habitat for wildlife. We're in the largest mass extinction of species in 65 million years. I mean, we're losing the the genetic wisdom of our planet on a massive scale. Humanity is attacking the the, the library of of knowledge of of genetics here, causing hundreds of species to go extinct every day, according to the people who are studying this. And it's driven by animal agriculture, destroying these rich uh, environments, the oceans and the rainforests where, where animals and plants and all, you know, beings live, uh, and destroying uh, virtually everything, aquifers, soil, all of that. So when we take it as a large package, uh, and, and the climate is included in that, it, it becomes overwhelming. And again, we just don't hear about it because of the, the bias in the media uh, away from anything that will make the advertisers unhappy. So I'd like to read three statements and I'd like for you to tell me what our diet has to do with any of this. Number one, tropical coral reef coverage around the world has declined by 30 to 50 percent since the 1980s. Nearly 75% of the world's reefs face threats from pollution, habitat destruction, overfishing, and increasingly a changing climate that increases temperatures, sea level, and acidity in the oceans. Next, point two. Ocean acidity has increased 30% since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. This increases 100 times faster than any change in acidity experienced by marine organisms for at least the last 20 million years. Number three. Um, Largest ever Gulf dead zones reveal stark impacts of industrial agriculture. A new survey of the dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico sounds alarm and points to extreme overuse of toxic chemicals from farms and CAFOs. So the three things I'm mentioning is the coral reefs one, ocean acidification two, and dead zones in the ocean three. What does this have to do with our diet, any of these things? Yeah, I think, again, this is a, a direct result of animal agriculture. It's pretty obvious. We lived in an RV for 17 years, traveling all over the, North America. And uh, I'm telling you, I mean, most of this of North America has been uh, reduced to vast monocropped fields of genetically engineered corn and soy, primarily alfalfa and other feed grains for imprisoned animals. 
especially people don't think of it, but vast areas of, for example, Mississippi and other states grow uh, genetically engineered corn and soy to feed to factory farm catfish. Fish eat a huge amount of grain also, factory farmed fishes. So all, these, so, so all of these uh, monocrop fields, these are killing fields. I mean, nothing is allowed to grow except one species. It's the complete opposite of nature. Nature is, wants to have a party. You know, nature, so let's have, let's have lots of, you know, let's have a whole complex ecosystem. And monocropping is the result of 10,000 years of animal agriculture, the mentality of, of, of a war against nature, basically. A war against animals, a war against life. And so we just now do plant agriculture the way we do animal agriculture, and so we don't allow anything to live on that land. So you have you know, thousands of acres where any uh, animal that tries to live there, you kill them. Any plant other than the corn or soy that tries to live there, you kill them. Any insects that might get in the way, you kill them. It's killing everything. And so all of the uh, pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides end up in the water. But more, and even more importantly, in some ways, uh, the, the chemical fertilizers, because the transition is away from soil to oil. So the foundation of agriculture, as the, as the topsoil gets destroyed, when, when the Europeans came here, there was like 15 to 20 feet of topsoil in the United It was incredibly rich. Now we're down to just inches. And so uh, we're using uh, petroleum, basically natural gas, to create nitrogen fertilizer that then creates what's called eutrophication of the water. It, 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 uh, it's it's nutrient-rich runoff from all of this nitrogen fertilizer accumulating, for example, in the Mississippi River from, from the whole heartland of the United States and going into the Gulf of Mexico. So there's these dead zones where uh, nothing can live because of the algae blooms, which when they bloom, they suck the oxygen out of the water. And so any marine animals that are living there, they either have to leave and get out of there if they, if they can, but usually, or they die. And the algae also, besides basically creating a huge dead zone where nothing can live, nothing can survive, and when it dies, it creates a huge amount of acid in the water and contributes to the acidification of the oceans. And this acidification of the oceans uh, is destroying shellfish, their capacity to, uh, to make shells and coral reefs and so forth. So animal agriculture demands massive amounts of grain because these animals, really, they're eating machines. They eat huge quantities, cows uh, especially, but all these animals eat a, need to eat an enormous amount to fatten them up. And uh, so we could feed everyone on a fraction of the land. This is the beautiful thing. The reverse of this is the good news that we could feed everyone on a fraction of the land. And I'm going to farther away. Okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, and allow these dead zones to heal. And and the and the huge dead zone. Uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, it's only one of about 50 to 70 major dead zones all around the world. They're everywhere. It's not just in the Gulf of Mexico. So it's animal agriculture as it spreads uh, worldwide through this proliferation of ConAgra and, and Kentucky Fried Chicken and Burger King and Monsanto and all these companies. We're seeing these dead zones uh, also spreading and the acidification and destruction of ocean habitat. It's all driven by animal agriculture, essentially, and the wastefulness, the extreme wastefulness uh, of animal agriculture, essentially. I have a question for uh, Will and Ocean, which is, you know, I'm learning a lot just hearing you both talk, and I'm curious if you have a, a, a top three list or a top one list of what are the things that I think all of us here want to be thoughtful about what we eat, um, but as I said, we got to eat something. And what are the things, the tangible things that we can do that are a step in the right direction. You know, I often counsel people on, I say, here are the things I would do that you can easily do to improve your health. Do you have a primary care doctor? Do you drink alcohol to excess? Do you get a good night's sleep? Do you exercise? Do you do some mindfulness? You know, things like that. What are the things that you recommend to people when they walk out of this hotel that they can do, and myself included, uh, so that we can be more thoughtful about what we eat? Well, um, broadly, I love the Ornish program and the, the simple eat better, stress less, love more, move more. Uh, um, that's basically the same conclusion that Dan Buettner came to when he looked at the blue zones and where people live the longest and healthiest lives around the world when he wrote about that for National Geographic. But looking at the eat better part more specifically, um, 
I'd say number one is to substitute beans for beef. I mean, essentially more legumes as a basis for a lot of our protein and core nutrition. Um, ideally sprouted uh, and pressure cooked, um, but, but um, legumes are, are really nutritious and they're affordable and they're low environmental impact per calorie produced. And, um, and then I would, number two, say a lot of vegetables, like a lot, lot, lot of vegetables. Um, research is telling us that kind of the more vegetables we eat, the better, up to about 10 servings a day. A serving being defined as a half cup cooked or a cup of like salad or something. Up to about 10 servings a day, you get massive benefit. After that, it kind of tapers off. There's no harm done if you eat 20 or 30 servings a day, but the benefits go down. But Basically, the more you eat up to 10 servings a day, the healthier you will be, and that's pretty much across every statistical measure with just about every disease known, chronic disease known to humanity. Um, so those are probably the number two things. I could definitely say, you know, getting off of all animal products or certainly the factory farmed ones. I, I said beef because that's the biggest culprit, certainly from an environmental standpoint, from a health standpoint, from an ethical standpoint. You know, all of the um, th all the industrialized animal products are pretty big culprits in a lot of misery. So, um, and then so more more whole plant foods, less processed junk, less sugar, and less animal products. That wasn't exactly three, but those are my core messages. Thank you, Ocean. I you know my feeling is that um, <clears throat> the best thing anyone can do is to really make an effort to understand the consequences of our food choices, uh, all our lifestyle choices, really, in general, and then, and then we'll be motivated uh, to make a positive change. And I think if we, at least from my perspective, make that effort, um, we discover that plant-based foods provide all the nutrients that we need to be healthy and and liberate ourselves and others in wonderful ways. And so I think one of the things I, I notice that people don't seem to understand is that it's important that we get enough calories. Uh, I think starches are really wonderful. So I'm kind of a, a pro, uh, Dr. John McDougall talks about this, and I think he's right, that a lot of people move to a plant-based diet and they're afraid of carbohydrates. So I think complex carbohydrates are fantastic, like potatoes, sweet potatoes, grains, and so forth, legumes, of course, vegetables, uh, and fruits have lots of complex carbohydrates, and, and you need to get plenty of calories, clean calories, but I think organic is critical. Uh, I would really emphasize the importance of, of e paying the extra money and eating organically grown plant-based foods. And uh, the other thing I think that's interesting in this whole thing is that people have this idea that, well, I'll stop eating red meat and then uh, maybe then give up chicken, and then maybe fish, and then maybe uh, eggs, and then maybe dairy, something like that. But I think in many ways, the most violent and destructive to our health, especially foods, are uh, dairy, eggs, and fish. You know, those three, they're seen by many people to see like they're better somehow. But fish really, uh, enormous suffering that these animals endure, and, the t and, con and they concentrate so many toxins. And dairy, I think, is probably even more violence and suffering in, uh, in cheese than in meat because these poor animals, they're horribly sexually abused. Their babies are stolen. And I've, I've lived in an RV, like I say, and I spent quite a bit of time you know, camping all over the place. And I've heard many times at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, I've been within earshot of a dairy and heard the wailing and moaning and almost like screaming of these cows whose babies have been stolen. They go on and on and on. And the heartbreak of these poor cows who have their babies stolen. And um, the, just the, to understand the toxicity of dairy products, I mean, it's so... Uh, violent to our bodies to be eating uh, casein, for example. We don't have renin like calves have to break down this protein. It causes mayhem. It causes, you know, type 1 diabetes. There's so many problems directly attributable to, to casein, uh, to IGF-1 growth hormone, which is like throwing gasoline on a fire. If we have cancer cells in our body, it's well understood. The estrogen uh, is destructive on, to our society, the, the, what it does to girls, what it does to boys, what it does uh, to our bodies. Uh, and on so many ways. So dairy, uh, there's no end to the violence and abuse and horror of the dairy industry. And eggs are very similar. 
Uh, this is the most concentrated glob of cholesterol on planet Earth is an egg yolk, and there's nothing really necessary in these foods for, for health. There's a lot of things that are very harmful, enormous amounts of cruelty. You can't think of anything more violent and, and abusive than to be born as a, 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 a hen uh, in a battery cage where you, you can't spread your wings your entire life. Uh, have your beak chopped off uh, as soon as you're a little baby. A lot of little chicks, you know, they die right on the spot. It's extremely painful and shocking to lose the end of your beak, and it's chronic pain for the rest of your life. And these animals are abused beyond what we can even begin to imagine in terms of violence. And so we're not only causing violence, we're eating violence, we're eating terror, we're fe eating despair and anxiety and pain. And the problem with our society, I think, in many ways, is the gross materialism. We, since If we can't measure it scientifically, we say it doesn't exist. This is based on 10,000 years of animal agriculture, which has basically just shut us down to the reality that we're eating suffering and misery and that there's a, a reality to that and we're feeding that to our children. And how can we cr have relationships of harmony between men and women, for example, when the most basic activity that we're engaging in of eating animal foods is based on massive sexual violence and domination of female animals, of, of breaking the bond between the mother and her offspring. And this is the foundation of animal agriculture is as soon as a mother gives birth to a baby, she wants to love and nurture that baby on any uh, animal operation. It doesn't matter, backyard operation, commercial farm, you always kill the baby, you always steal the baby, you always impregnate her again on a rape rack. And that's, un that's just the reality. It's been like that for 10,000 years. And so the underlying uh, violence in our society that we don't seem to be able to come to terms with in terms of our relationships with each other uh, in families and, uh, and between nations and so forth, you can trace it. There's an old saying in China. When I was in China, I've been to China quite a few times, and there's an old saying, it goes way back, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, they say, the saying is, uh, if you want to know why there are wars, listen to the cries that come from the slaughterhouse at night. And that's an ancient saying, and it, it underlies the reality, I think, that um, these animal-based foods, especially the ones that especially violate the female animals, like eggs uh, and dairy products, I think they, they concentrate so many both physical toxins and what I refer to uh, in the World Peace Diet as metaphysical toxins. And there's a reality to this that uh, we are, I think, beginning to realize. And so the good news is that the more we move toward uh, a whole food, organic, plant-based diet, the healthier and happier we'll be. And uh, I would just suggest people to just do the best they can to move in that direction and question the narrative that is compelling them not to do it, actually. Yeah. Thank you for those answers. Uh, I switched two years ago to a plant-based diet, and it was really hard for me because, well, because I have a real sweet tooth, but I also love... Uh, I grew up in the South where red meat was essential. And so the way that I've been able to do it is that I have to distract myself. So when I'm at work, I get two en enormous salads and I open up a medical journal and I eat. And it's not a very thoughtful way of doing it, but it's a way for me to not sit there and think, oh, I'm eating something that's not as good as that cheeseburger. So I don't know how that fits in, but it, I found that I have more energy uh, and I did lose some weight by doing that switch, so uh, I, it was not easy. But I'm, I, and it, again, none of this is in medical school. Uh, we don't teach it in medical school. Um, and my hope is that we can somehow figure out a way to include this because it, it's essential. So. The one thing I, I, sh I should just mention, I, was, I listened to Michael Clapper give a talk and he was saying how um, he ran into a friend of his, Kim Williams, who's the, he I think he's the head of the cardiology, the, uh, the heart, the heart, uh, car American uh, Cardiology Institute, something like that. He's a very well-known cardiologist, and he's a vegan. And he's uh, the head of a hospital, a cardiology department of a large hospital in Chicago. And so he said, how are you doing, Kim? And, and, and he didn't look like he was too happy. And they talked about it, and apparently, as the head of the cardiology unit, he had been gradually, over the, over the months and years, bringing more and more cardiologists into his department who were plant-based and teaching uh, and, and sharing this idea that they should get the, uh, their patients, instead of giving them a quadruple heart bypasses, to get them to move to a plant-based way of eating and solving the problem that way. And he was saying that just uh, like the week before, he'd been called in to the, the head of the hospital 
and they were really upset with him. And they said, listen, you know, for, for years and years, the cardiology unit of this hospital was the biggest money maker. We made the most money. He said, what you're doing, we can't tolerate this. I mean, you, the, the profits have just collapsed. You can't do this anymore. And he was thinking, you know, what am I gonna do? And, and, um, and that was sort of the, the, that's the dilemma, essentially, for, the, 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 um, for, for many hospitals that are really based on making their profits from disease. There are some, I think, like Kaiser and maybe some others, where uh, it's more of a subscription. I, you know, I, don't, I don't have insurance. I don't know anything about this. But anyway, I guess the, the, the hospital is uh, more, incur they do better if people are healthier. I guess that, that would be the way to go. Because he said he had uh, dinner later, a, a few weeks later, with a, an insurance guy. And the insurance guy was saying that they understand now that people who are eating a plant-based diet are so much healthier, and so they're going to, they're, the insurance company is going to start pressuring the hospitals to change what they're doing so it'll be cheaper for them. So that's kind of maybe the solution to the problem is what Michael Clapper was saying, but it's a very interesting dynamic that's happening right now. I'd like to, uh, again, ask how our food choices um, affect this, these questions. So here's four, four more things I'd like to un understand better. Um, one, isn't it natural for an animal to provide milk? You know, what's wrong with us going and milking a cow and getting its milk? It might not hurt them to just get the milk. They've been doing it on farms for a long time. Second, is it true that only pregnant cows provide milk? You know, as we all think that cows have milk, are we saying that a cow actually doesn't have milk unless, the, unless they're impregnated? Uh, third, are we saying that cows do or don't have antibiotics? In other words, do they add antibiotics to cows? So when we have dairy products, are there antibiotics added to it? And then finally, fish farms, are they adding antibiotics to that? And or, you know, is, is that a good solution? So if you'd comment on our, comment on these things. So h humans are the only but so mammal it is a lactating animal, right, with mammary glands. And um, humans are the only mammal that consumes the milk of another mammal. And we're the only mammal that consumes any milk after infancy. So the notion that consuming cow's milk is somehow our biological imperative is rather odd from an evolutionary perspective. Humans have been only, only been doing it for a relative blip of time. And our bodies aren't really well cut out for it, which is why actually a majority of people on the planet are lactose intolerant after infancy. Our, our bodies can handle it when we're little, but then we kind of grow out of it. And um, so there's a lot of racism here with milk, actually, because mostly people of color around the world, generally speaking, it's only people of European descent that are able to handle lactose, typically, um, without getting indigestion. Um, so as far as whether cows, well, they're not actually pregnant necessarily when they're providing milk, but they have been impregnated and they've had babies who were, as, as Will was talking about, taken away from them at one day old, and then they continue to produce milk for quite some time until their production goes down and then they're impregnated again. And it's this continuous cycle and the boys are often turned into veal and the girls are tof, ter, often turned into more milk cows. And so the milk industry is kind of inextricably linked with the whole system. It's very difficult to get away from that. In India, where cows are sacred traditionally, there are cows just running around everywhere and they're not all producing milk all the time because traditionally it was actually considered wrong to kill them. Cows were considered holy and worshipped. So there are just cows all over the place and cow poop all over the place too, I might add, having been there once during a monsoon storm and seen the water turn brown all around me as I walked home from school. Um, but... Um, yeah, let's see, what was your other questions? Um, <laughs> that image is really stuck in my head now. <laughs> I was really afraid I was going to float away. <laughs> the antibiotics in fish farms? Antibiotics, yes, antibiotics are being used in fish farms. It's pretty dreadful. Um, and I will add also, just so you have this picture in your head, that salmon farms, they're adding food coloring to the salmon farms water because the 
salmon would be gray otherwise because they're not being fed their natural diet in there. Um, but yes, antibiotics are routinely used in fish farms. They're literally put into the water so the fish will absorb it through their gills. And um, so this is also creating a whole other exposure point for antibiotic resistance, resistant bacteria to develop. Did I address it all? Okay. Thanks, the ocean. I just want to add a couple of things. Oh, a break clap, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, please don't, please don't, please don't stop. <sighs> Um, I remember um, not too long ago, I was talking to a woman about dairy, and she was very well educated. She had a PhD. She was in Los Angeles, and she said, wait a minute. Are you telling me that cows don't just give milk? And I said, they're like us. You know, I mean, when a, when a girl grows up to a certain age, she doesn't then reach uh, puberty and then kind of walk down the street squirting milk out of her nipples, you know, <laughs> left and right, because she just now she can give milk. You know, she gives milk for the same reason, like a cow gives milk for the same reason that a human does. We, we uh, you know, get pregnant, we give birth to a little baby, and the milk is for the baby. And this is something I realize that many people aren't aware of, actually, that basic thing. But I really want to emphasize a couple more things here, because I think it's very important to understand this, that um, cows would naturally live about 25 years. And on any dairy, organic or not, when they are about five years old, maximum, between four and six years old, they're killed because their production declines, because they're worn out, because they're kept pregnant and lactating simultaneously. And no mammal is designed to be pregnant and lactating simultaneously. And uh, so when you impregnate, you know, they're brought into heat typically early through pro prolactin and other hormones. And then they give birth to a baby, and as soon as the baby is born, the baby is stolen. And it, irony, the irony is that the baby is then given soy milk, basically, to live, if they're going to keep the baby alive. But usually, mo most often, they just kill the babies, male or female. They, they kill them, or they use them for veal, male or female, they use them for veal. Um, sometimes the males they'll use for beef. Uh, one out of, typically a cow will give birth to four uh, babies and one will be, uh, become a slave on the dairy. The other three, whatever gender they are, will be killed either immediately or shortly thereafter. And typically what they do actually very often nowadays is they'll have, um, uh, impregnate them one more time and send them off to slaughter when they're about eight months pregnant so that they get two for one, basically, at the slaughterhouse so that after they kill the mother and then they uh, open her up, they have a baby in there that they can then, it's very profitable because uh, there's renin in the calf's stomach, the unborn calf's stomach, so they'll take that out uh, for making cheese. You need to coagulate the cheese, and so renin is really, rennet is what is used from the renin in the lining of the calf's stomach. But the other thing is uh, there's something called a bovine fetal, uh, fetal serum that is used in vaccinations. It's also actually ironically used in the uh, cre creation of um, cell-based meat you know, so-called vegan meat is actually made from bovine fetal serum. And they'll put a long needle, you know, into the, into the uh, heart of the, of the, and extract while the baby's still alive, uh, all this stuff, and then they'll kill the baby. So it's a, it's an abortion, a really violent abortion process that's done, you know, millions of times on a standard kind of standard procedure now to get more money out of these cows. So um, on a very fundamental level, um, there's an enormous amount of violence in the dairy industry. It's like I say, it's a violence towards the female and the baby. And so, what we're talking about with veganism, we're talking about ahimsa, which is non-violence. That's the basic idea. And it's kind of interesting because um, there's uh, the Hare Krishna uh, people have been really trying to figure out a way to have milk because they just feel like, well, you know, we should drink milk because uh, Prabhupada, you know, our teacher said, you know, dairy is sacred and the, and the whole thing is dairy is sacred. It's a, and, and so, uh, but they knew there was a lot of violence in the milk. So they decided to create a, a, a farm in uh, West Virginia that where they would have nonviolent milk, ahimsa milk. And, uh, and so it's interesting to read about it because they bought you know, quite a bit of land. They bought some cows and they started the, the operation of never harming the cows, of loving the cows, of never killing the cows and selling the milk to, to the other uh, Hare Krishna uh, you know, devotees in the area. And what were they going to do with the males? You know, because they have to keep impregnating them or their milk stops. You know, they have to keep impregnating because the milk will dry up. 
So half the babies that are born, statistically, are males. So their idea was that they would have the males castrated and use them as oxen. So they could, you know, like that was one of the traditions. But of course, um, after a, f a few oxen, they really didn't need any more. And the neighbors weren't interested. The neighbors said, we have tractors. You can keep your oxen. So they had to feed them, basically. And so, uh, and then as the, as the years went by, there were more and more cows that they had to feed. Uh, a lot of them were males, a lot of them got to be too old to give milk, a lot of them were not old enough yet to give milk, so they got to this point where they had, you know, maybe a couple of hundred cows and only maybe 50 were giving milk, the other 150 they had to feed, so the price of their milk was skyrocketing because they had to pay for all that and they needed to buy more land and they, you know, had to feed all these cows. And uh, finally, they just didn't know what to do, and they, they, they thought, well, you know, uh, the neighbors said that they would take, the neighbors said, well, we'll take your cows. And they said, well, you just promise you won't kill them. Oh, don't worry, we won't kill them, you know. <laughs> so that was, that was how, one of the ways they kind of solved the problem was they said, well, don't ask, don't tell. You know, we'll just kind of give them to the neighbors. And of course, the neighbors were getting free meat. And uh, this was for the Ahimsa uh, milk. So you really have to understand clearly, clear as a bell, you cannot have dairy without killing. You know, just really have to understand that. I mean, we, you have to kill the babies because you have to impregnate so many. You can't have the milk without impregnating. And, uh, and we, I saw that when I was in India. You know, it's very clear uh, because you have all these cows wandering the streets and they're, they're starving. They're eating plastic because when their production declines, they just let them go. They either send them to market, which means they get slaughtered in another state where, that allows the slaughtering of cows, or they let them go and they're wandering and they're horribly abused. They get eaten by dogs at night and so forth. I mean, it's really a, a terrible situation for these cows. They have no protection, really. And, um, and the interesting thing, I think, also is that this dairy cult in India um, is, is all about, you know, everyone is eating dairy. This, the, the white revolution has been promoted by the government to try to push everybody to eat more dairy products. This, the diabetes uh, rate in India has just gone through. They have the highest rate of diabetes in the world now. And the interesting thing also, I think, that's connected probably is that the rate of violence towards women is the highest in the world in India. Now, Delhi is the most dangerous city in the world to be a woman in terms of getting beaten and abused. Um, there's a direct connection between violence towards women and violence towards female animals. I mean, I think that's very clear, and that this is the way it's created. So we have to wake up again and realize that the dairy industry, if anyone's interested in liberation and equality, we can't be eating dairy products. This is the absolute antithesis of any kind of liberation for us as human beings in our relationships with each other.